Our Father, we thank you for the call to save the children of the world and to save the future of the world. The children are the future of the world and they are the future of the church. We pray, O oh Lord, that we'll hear your voice speaking to every heart tonight so that we will do the important thing we ought to do. Give us the love. Give us the commitment. Give us the wisdom. Help us to plant the seed at this time in the right season so that we can reap the fruit when the season of harvesting will come. We pray that there will be more enriching fellowship between parents and there will be the proper training of our children. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are considering an important subject and I plead that you keep awake. We're talking on parents fellowship and the training of our children. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself chapter 6 verse 4 and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In those verses we have read, we have the word of the Lord for husbands and wives and for their relationship of training, developing their own children. And as you look at other parts of scripture, that's the same thing you find out. As the Bible talks of the fellowship that ought to be between husband and wife. It also talks of the necessity of the training of our children. Tonight, as we approach uh, this subject, I'll be talking on the parents, then I'll be talking on the training of children. When I get to the section of the training of children, I'll be talking about what parents ought to do in the training of children. Then I would also be talking at the same time of what the teachers and the leaders that God himself has called and he has given you the important ministry of training children. I'll be talking about your responsibilities and as you carry out those responsibilities, great will be your reward in this world and in the world to come. Fellowship, the Greek is koinonia. And as we apply it to the parents, it involves partnership between husband and wife, communion between husband and wife, sharing between husband and wife, harmony, unity, love, caring. So as we're talking about the fellowship of parents, that is, the fellowship of a father and a mother, husband and a wife. We're talking of the partnership and the communion and the sharing, the harmony, the unity among them, the love and the caring. Parents' fellowship is the evidence, number one, of love and commitment to the marriage vows. That is what we look for in a home. That is what we look for in the relationship between a husband and a wife to show us the evidence that they love one another and they are committed to the vows they took at the marriage altar. Number two, parents' fellowship is the strength of the family. The winds may have their time of blowing. 
the flood may have its season of coming and it may be that external forces may have their time and period of beating against the home but the fellowship between husband and wife is the strength of that family in troublous times number three the fellowship is the insurance against division caused by prolonged misunderstanding if we allow misunderstanding to take root and we allow misunderstanding to get deep into our heart and into the whole system and to take over the center of our family relationship there will be division if we are not watchful that thing may lead to separation if care is not taken it may lead to divorce it is the fellowship we have between husband and wife that is the insurance against the division that may be caused by prolonged misunderstanding number four that fellowship is the anchor and the reassurance in hard times and stormy period number five the fellowship is an effective medicine that heals family hearts there are times that when two minds rub together friction may occur and in the friction of the minds rubbing together there may be hurts on either side or on both sides it is the fellowship that will be the effective medicine that will heal the hurts in the family number six the fellowship is the foundation for training of the children if there is no fellowship if there is separation if there is division the children will notice it and we fathers and mothers who are not in fellowship we will not have anything to teach our children if we try to teach those children the teaching may not be effective because the foundation for the training has been destroyed number seven the fellowship is the best practical teaching aid for our children who are observing us the children are very intelligent and they are very observant if they see that there is fellowship we never fight we never argue we never say anything disrespecting to one another we never frown at one another we never hold keep malice with one another our children never see us argue about anything and the children see that there is love there is partnership and there is joy and there is peace there is unity there is harmony there is communion and there is the togetherness and the sharing and the respect for one another between husband and wife their daddy and their mommy that in itself is the best practical teaching aid for our children who are very very observant we'll say more about the fellowship later now the training of our children training is both our duty and our privilege every christian family desiring to please the lord will delight in the training of their children our obedience to god our loyalty to christ cannot be complete without the training of the children analyze your christian life put all your christian duties and responsibilities in the open and if the training of your children the developing of your children the bringing up of your children if it is missing no matter what else you are doing your loyalty to christ your obedience to god is not complete don't you know animals train their offsprings to function in line with their nature the eagles will uh, teach the eaglets to fly and the animals will teach the, uh, the offspring to understand the ways of the forest 
and the ways of self-defense and the ways of preservation in the bush, in the forest. And the animals will understand how to pass across all the things those animals need to do by instinct. They know how to pass it across to the little, little animals so that these animals will develop and you find them functioning like the parent animals. If animals train their offspring, and we humans don't train our offspring, and we become worse than animals, we cannot claim to be higher than the animals. And if we who are Christians, we fail in the teaching and the training and the developing of our children, where is the place for God's grace? Where is the place for obedience to the scripture that commands us we must have concrete plans in training our children, our personal joy, and the fulfillment of our calling and ministry, as well as our eternal rest and reward, all depend on our faithfulness and thoroughness in training our children. No man's life is well spent and no man is actually successful if he neglects the training of his children we misunderstand the definition of success if we think that we are successful in anything we're doing when the training of our children has been neglected if we are really going to be successful the training of our children will be brought into priority the church that neglects the teaching and the training of children lacks the wisdom of the spirit of god we're going to consider three points number one building the family fellowship building the family fellowship number two basic qualities of trainers of children the basic qualities that the parents who are going to be successful and effective in training children the basic qualities they will have and the basic qualities that the leaders and the workers in our children churches who are involved in the training of children the basic qualities they need to possess we'll see in point number two number three balanced training of our children it is not just training because there is one-sided training and there is a kind of training that educates the head above the heart. There is a kind of training that makes the head to run a thousand miles beyond the heart. We're talking about of a, of a balanced training that brings the heart and the head and the hands and every part of the life of the child working in coordination together moving forward in all the aspects that god has outlined for the child balanced training of our children number one building the family fellowship building the family fellowship now you understand i'm not just talking about praying together that's important. I'm not just talking about spending 30 minutes together reading the Bible, and we call that family fellowship. That's very important. But 30 minutes out of 24 hours of the day with your wife is not fellowship. And 30 minutes out of the 168 hours in the whole week, that is not fellowship just that brief period of time is not enough for the wife to fully understand the husband and for the husband to fully understand the wife it's not the 30 minutes little time we have in reading bible and praying that we call fellowship we're talking about the totality of your life we're talking about two hearts melting together we're talking about two lives shared together we're talking about two personalities becoming a single 
single personality. We're talking about two brains thinking alike. We're talking about two lives that are so wedded together, so melted together, so joined together, cleaving together, that what that one is thinking is what this one is thinking. What this one is planning is what that one is planning. Even when they are separated by time, they are conscious of one another's presence. We're talking about a kind of fellowship that goes beyond the 30 minutes or the one hour that we're sent to be together. And I'm not talking of just spending time together to resolve problems. If we never smile together, we never laugh together, we never rejoice together, we never share together, we never eat together, we never do anything together except we come together when there is a problem. That's not fellowship. We're talking about the total thing that the husband and the wife will come together and they know that really they are together. Even when they are separated for a brief moment of time, you go to your place of work, he goes to his place of work. Even when they are separated by distance physically, there is such a wonderful fellowship among them. They are separated here, their minds are still together. That's the kind of fellowship we're talking about. How can we build that kind of family fellowship? Building the parents' fellowship is not the work of one day. And it is not the assignment of one month. It is the work of a lifetime. You've been married for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. Still, fellowship ought to be increasing and continuing because it is the duty and the assignment of a lifetime. And uh, when we talk about fellowship, uh, we need to know that this is the very center of uh, the desire of God for husband and wife. In Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Can I make an illustration to you from this place uh, so that you understand the fellowship we're talking about? Adam was made to sleep. And then the bone was taken, one of the ribs. And what was taken out of him means that now he is not complete because something had been taken away from him. And then God made a woman. And then that woman was brought unto him. Now, fellowship is that this bone was taken from near the heart. The woman is brought back to this man. If that woman stays in that separate room and this man stays in that separate room if it is only physical for convenience that's all right but if that is symbolic that their hearts are in separate places their minds are in separate places their desires are in separate places and they are not really together and that woman does not come back to the place where the bone and the rib was originally taken near the heart there is no fellowship fellowship means that this woman the wife taken out of the man is brought back to the man to occupy the same place where that bone was taken away originally it is when that happens and that continues to happen that that woman is exactly in that place where that bone was taken away very near to the heart of the man all the time that is what we call fellowship between husband and wife in um, psalm 68 psalm 68 and in verse 6 in psalm 68 verse 6 god setteth the solitary in families now there are people that they are used to lonely lives before they were converted they're used to not having any friend not having any prayer partner not having anybody to share anything with the love the isolation but now when god brings you into the marriage relationship you now understand that god setteth the solitary 
in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. And, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Now, when we talk about the fellowship between husband and wife, there are three different people or parties that contribute to that fellowship. The first party, that's the pastor. The pastor of a church, the leader of a local church, has much to contribute to the family life of each couple in the church. It is not just that, you know, the husband and the wife, they have their responsibility, they have their assignment, they must work it out, they must be in fellowship, that's all right. But then the pastor, the leader of the local church, has responsibility in making sure that he is contributing to the fellowship of every family in the church. What does the pastor do? to contribute to the fellowship of every family. Number one, his example. The example of the pastor's family life may develop or destroy other families in the church. The fellowship that he has, the love that he has, the giving that he does, the sharing that he practices with his own wife will be an example to the church, to all the families in the church, that that one is like a beacon. It's like a, a light on the lighthouse. And we see that the pastor never fights with his wife. And there's no time the wife uh, packs out and threatens and going to leave uh, my husband. And the members of the church are coming to say, uh, if you leave, we know that we know the kind of uh, husband you have, but it will destroy the church. When people see that, there is no encouragement for individual families in the church to have real fellowship in their own families. Number two, practical positive preaching on the family with illustrations of good, happy families rather than negative, problematic families. If you are going to contribute to the fellowship in every family, you will be giving messages and you will be preaching and you will be illustrating your preaching on the family with good happy families every time you mention families you'll not be talking of only those who are fighting only those who are married and they are regretting the marriage those people who are married and they are not uh, living happily together if that's all the example you are giving every time you are not helping the families in that church to have good fellowship among themselves number three holding couples programs very often as well as men's programs in addition to the women's programs. In our church here, we have women's programs. And maybe in most of our churches, the women, they have monthly program where they are telling them how to behave, how to conduct their lives, how to do this, how to do that, things related to the home and things related to balanced ministry of women. If you in the church, we are having all those women having those programs and the men never have any program. And the men are still as stingy as ever, selfish as ever, inconsiderate as ever. And they do not know the kind of language. They never smile to the wife and they beat the wife down, cut the wife into pieces. Although the women are having the fellowship every month so that they'll be able to know how to do things better in the family. Because the men are not having the kind of fellowship the women are having to talk to ourselves as men. The fellowship will not be real in every family. Number four, counseling families before things fall apart. Sometimes counseling is too late. We bring the medicine after the patient has died. Therefore, make sure that as a pastor, to contribute to the fellowship of every family, counsel the families before things fall apart. Number five, uphold the expected family qualification. That is, when we're choosing workers, when we're choosing people to do something in the church, uphold the expected family qualification. Whatever the talent or the gift of the individual before they are selected and to be involved in the service of the Lord. 
If you find that a man has ability, he can preach, he can talk, he can quote scripture, he can, you know, call heaven down, but his wife is an unbeliever, or his wife is a backslider, or his wife was coming to church before, but the wife is no more coming to the church. And the wife is unrighteous and irreligious. Whatever the qualification of the man, if you are going to keep to the scripture, you'll say, well, charity begins at home. Preaching begins at home. Spirituality begins at home. If you are going to teach the church of God, teach your wife at home. And we have to also turn it the other, on the other way around. If you find that a woman is uh, has talent has everything you are thinking about but the husband is another story we have to look at the bible the word of god and know that when you come into the service of the lord you are not coming in isolation if you're a family man we must look at your home and so these things are very important that if pastors will take care of that then we will know that you are helping the families to have real family fellowship now there is the part of the members the members of the church take a church and you have members of that church and then you look at a family we want this family to develop family fellowship what are the responsibilities of the members of the church in helping in encouraging each family to keep the kind of fellowship they ought to have members of the church they have their parts to play in each family to build a strong fellowship and relationship number one members should be taught to respect the privacy of each family let members of the church know that once a man and a woman they have come together in marriage there is a circle drawn around them and no member of the church is allowed or permitted by god and his word to cross that line and get into that circle let the members know that that circle inside which the husband and the wife are living and staying and sharing is a sacred ground for that single couple and no member of the church has any chance has any right to trespass and get into that circle and begin to disturb the husband and wife i hope you understand what i mean the privacy of every family that you will the members will never speak publicly or privately about the problems of that family it's sacred ground they mustn't touch that area number two not to engage in any friendship with a man or a woman who is married to the point that that friendship between this member of the church and the spouse will bring division into the family once a member of a church whether a man is befriending a man and his friendship with that man man to man intimacy with that man man to man the sharing the discussion with that man man to man goes so far as to make the man get attached to his friend and separate in any way from the wife that is already wrong and a woman a member of the church must not carry on any friendship with another married woman that makes that married woman to be so committed to that sister that now he doesn't uh, she doesn't cherish the fellowship with her husband because all that she wants to discuss everything she wants to pray about everything she wants to plan that other sister is feeling the need of the husband they are not having any morality together anything evil together but you see there is such a close fellowship in between that woman and the other woman that the married woman doesn't see the need of being in fellowship with her husband therefore we must tell the members that members are not supposed to go so far to a married man 
or to a married woman that will bring division in that family. Of course, also, a woman should not maintain any friendship with a husband of another woman to the point that the friendship and the discussion and the sharing and the praying together and whatever it is we are doing together will affect that man and make the commitment of that man to be to this woman rather than to his wife. Neither will a man have any friendship with another man's wife that uh, will eventually bring division between that um, wife and the husband. Here is wisdom for the pastor. That before that sister got married, she was very close to you, not foreseen, for counseling, for instruction, for direction, and everything. Now that sister is married, as a pastor, be wise. Immediately, you will cut off the relationship, even of the counseling. Because you see that young married lady will still like to come to you and say, Sir, pastor, and will still like to be seeking counseling like before marriage. And the husband of that lady, she, he may not talk, he may not have, he may not even know that that is going to affect their marriage, but you are not allowing the fellowship in that family to develop properly. God will give us wisdom. It, number three, it means also the church and the members will be interceding for families in the church. If you hear about anything, or you don't hear but you observe anything between husband and wife, it's not for gossip, it's not for criticism, it's not for public consumption, it's for intercession. You pray for families in the church. And then, number four, if you see the necessity of helping the family, giving something to the family, give wisely, because they are loved. Between husband and wife is greater than the money you are trying to give. It's greater than the clothes you are trying to give. It's greater than the shoes you are trying to buy for one of the members of the family. If you're giving money or you're giving any substance to a man, makes him so dependent upon you, and there is a secret sharing between you that the man is not being unfaithful, withdrawing from the wife. Your giving is unscriptural. Therefore, let us tell members of the church that they will understand that in helping families, we do it wisely, with pure motives, not to set one member of the family against the other member of the family. Number five, members of our church, who are going to visit families, let your visit strengthen the family. Don't let your discussion when you visit the family, your interrogation questions when you visit the family, and members of the church tell them when they visit another family in our church, let not their visit separate the partners. Let not their visit bring any negative thing into that family. Let the visit strengthen the family. Number six, if we have in-laws in the church, what I mean is we have brother A married to sister B. And brother A and sister B who are now married together, they have relatives who are deeper life members. Junior brothers, junior sisters, they are also born again. They are children of God. They are even members of deeper life. One those deeper life in-laws. And tell them not to attempt to run another person's family. God will never give you grace to do the work he has not given you to do. The running of their family and the organization of their family and the way their family will be is their responsibility. And God has not given you the responsibility to run that man's family or to run that sister's family. The assignment he has not given you members. The assignment he has not given you workers. If you try to do it, you will not have grace to do it. You are going to ruin their family and God is going to judge you for it. In-laws, tread softly and tread prayerfully. Now, we've talked about the family fellowship and the part that the pastor plays and the part that members of the church play. I now come to the family itself now.
I come to the husband and the wife. And you have the greater part to play. Because if your family is going to really stand well, uh, then you really have a lot to do. Let me give you, this is just an illustration. This is not a verse really for the family. But I want to use it for an illustration. Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 10 and in verse 15. Second Kings chapter 10 verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonada, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. So he saluted him and said unto him, Is thine heart right? As my heart is with thine heart. And Jehonada answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to come into the chariot. I told you it's not really verse for the family, but it's an illustration of the fellowship, the togetherness, the unity, the harmony, the sharing we ought to have in the family. Before the marriage, we pray for the will of God, and our understanding in that prayer is that God knows all hearts. He knows my heart, and he knows the hearts of all the rest of the people. He knows my life, he knows the lives of all the rest of the people. And he's going to bring two hearts together, two lives together. And then the thing that God is checking up, whose heart is like the heart of this person, that can easily come together, join together, live together, share together, and move forward together. And then God finds the second half of your life, and it brings you together. If your heart is right with my heart, give me your hand, and then you give one another's hand in marriage. That togetherness in heart, in spirit, in attitude, internally, desiring, loving as the other partner, the spouse is, that must continue if we're really going to have the fellowship. In Ephesians once again, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25, husbands love your wives. Let's stop there for a moment. Even if we didn't know any other verse concerning fellowship between husband and wife, where there is love, every other thing will fall into place. The same thing as the husband is supposed to love the wife. The wife is also supposed to love the husband. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. Once again, here we find wife being taught, being led on how to love their husbands. And it's very important that husband and wife will learn to love one another. Songs. The songs of Solomon. Songs of Solomon. Here we are still reading about the sharing, the communion that ought to be between husband and wife. And as you think about all these things, then you understand that this is how you are to love your husband this is how you are to love your wife in um, chapter chapter 8 reading from verse 6 songs of solomon chapters 8 verse 6 set me as a seal upon thine heart as a seal upon thine arm. 
For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement heat. In verse 6, set me as a seal upon thine heart. Now you see, when you go into some offices of a non-believer, now these some believers, although they are not born again, but if they are married, and if they are uh, looking at the at least the external principles of husband and wife, sometimes you get into a man's office and you see the portrait of the wife that is placed on the table. Sometimes you find if the wife had been transferred, let's say, to another town, and they're still resolving how to make the wife come back together to the husband so that they'll be in the same city, in the same house, in the same place. But for now, walk and separate them. Unbelievers, you will find that the man he will have on his study desk at home, although the wife is at, where is it, Abuja or Kaduna? or wherever it is working, the man at home on the desk where he studies frequently, he will have the portrait of the wife there all the time. He may not even bother to keep his own portrait there. It's there. Uh, that is, he's setting the wife as a seal upon the table. Now, for the believer, it is not the picture on the table make her to be in your heart when you are separated she has gone to work she has gone to market she has gone anywhere and you are separated by distance set me as a seal upon thine heart what the unbelievers are trying to carry out and they are putting the portrait or the picture on the table so that they will remember every time and these men that i'm talking about when they are first married and they have the picture there their secretary comes and sees that picture of the wife on their table and the people that are coming to them from here and there they see the picture is there all the time the man has a wedding ring he's an unbeliever but at least he wants to remember the wife and the picture of the wife is there on the table all the time and she is thinking about the wife and you will find that such husbands when they get to the office if there's telephone there they phone abuja how are you doing good morning every day they say good morning together unbelievers married husband and wife and there are so-called believers husband and wife even when they are living in the same house they don't say good morning not to talk of when the wife is transferred to abuja and if these some believers they will set the wife there and every time when they get to the office the first thing to do is to phone their wife far away in that time how are you doing how is work and then we'll tell them about how the children are going on how this one is all right and whatever a uh, problem they have they share together and although they are separated by distance unbelieving couples they still try to keep in fellowship together isn't that a challenge to you and to me that if the unbelieving us not all of them we know them but if some of them will do that how much more those of us who are real christians now in verse 7 many waters cannot quench love neither can the floods down eat if a man will give all the substance of his house for love it would utterly be contemned what this is saying is that you may be married to a man that doesn't have money but you have love you see a rich man outside that money you know is far away there's no comparison between that money and love therefore you keep to your husband you keep to your wife because the money will not replace that love the money is so much ahead is so much greater sorry the love is so much greater than the money now, as we talk about the fellowship that ought to be, there are many verses, but if I go too far on this, I'll not be able to talk of the training of children. Let me now write the word family. You write the word family vertically. And I'm going to use the letters of the word family. F 
A M I L Y. I'm going to use those uh, letters uh, to, so that you can remember that when you get back home, here is the kind of fellowship that ought to be between husband and wife. F, forgiveness and faithfulness. Fellowship with God begins with forgiveness. Fellowship with one another begins with forgiveness and it continues and is strengthened with faithfulness. You begin with forgiveness and then you continue with faithfulness. You begin each new day in a clean state with a clean slate. You begin each new day without remembrance of past offenses or misunderstanding. You wake up in the new day. It's a new day, a new wife, a new husband. I don't mean that you have 365 wives in one year. I mean that you have one wife that has been renewed in relationship every day of the year. That uh, you wake up in the morning, you look at your wife as if she has never, never, never offended you. There is forgiveness. That last night, whatever it was, the moment we slept, everything of the past was forgiven and forgotten. And you wake up in the morning, a new day, a new relationship, and you look at that husband as if he never did anything wrong, he never said anything wrong, he never misbehaved, he never mistreated you, you are forgiven and forgotten the past, every new day is really a new day. You see one another and you think of one another as if you never had an argument. You never had something that you disagreed either in principle or in practical a kind of discussion as if there was never a difference between you. That's the very basis of family fellowship and uh, faithfulness of course. You live in one another's presence when you are even physically separated you're physically separated here you are you are in different offices during the day and yet you are living in one another's presence any lady you are talking to anybody you are conversing with you know that although your wife is not there physically present it's like your wife is sitting there and you wouldn't uh, be embarrassed if your wife had all the discussion you're having with that woman because actually you will never carry out any discussion with any woman except what your husband can hear and even when he is not there physically when she is not there physically you understand you are living in one another's presence even when you are physically separated now the next word is the next letter is a acceptance of the spouse as he is Ac acceptance of the husband as he is and acceptance of the wife as she is while you are patiently waiting for the desired change of the hostly there is room for growth there is room for change there is room for development and while we're waiting for God to perfect the change and to mature that wife and to develop that husband we are accepting that man for now as he is we are accepting that woman as she is there will never be true fellowship while we are preoccupied with the question why is she like this why is he talking like that why does he have this kind of uh, little understanding how is it that uh, every time we discuss, I'm always finding out that I'm so educated and she is an illiterate? How is it as uh, if uh, whenever we are discussing, I saw that she is a graduate, she resists like a primary school lady? You never think like that. You never talk like that. There is never a complaint. There is never a critical attitude. There is never a negative thought. There is never a negative reaction. You just accept that man, accept that woman as he is, as she is. And then you turn the rest into the hands of the Lord. That's what brings fellowship. When I never talk about the shortcomings of that person. When I never talk about any kind of deformity, any kind of thing that is not really appropriate that she is doing, or if you are the wife that he is doing, and you just accept one another as you are while waiting patiently for the desired change. 
M, meekness in relationship with one another. No pride, no superiority, inferiority, conflict, and battle. And there is no contest. We'll see who will win. No, we're together. Your failure is my failure. My failure is your failure. Husband and wife, understand. There is nobody. You are not fighting for anything. You are not trying to prove the husband is better than the wife. It's a useless exercise. It's not necessary. Why should you try to prove as the husband that you are better than the wife? There's no point. Why should you try to prove as the wife you are better than the husband there is no point we must understand that our lives have been merged together melted together and the two shall become one it's a useless unnecessary argument to find out whether my right hand is better than my left hand was the use if i find out the right hand is better am i going to cut off the left hand it's a useless exercise to be finding out which one is stronger my right leg or my left leg what's the point without the left leg i cannot move even if the right leg is so strong uh, I, I need the left leg i need both of those legs it's a useless argument trying to find out which one is uh, better my right kidney or my left kidney have you done your medical exam recently which one is better you don't know i don't know too why are we arguing then about which one is better husband or wife wife or husband we are together we are one the shortcoming of the wife is a shortcoming of the husband and the success of the husband is the success of the wife therefore there is no argument there is meekness in relationship with one another lowliness humility patiently bearing each other's bodies accord uh, uh, you'll then be able to avoid argument avoid pride it's a very bad thing if the wife is demonstrating her mastery of grammar over the husband when they are discussing why are you doing that you are going to spoil the fellowship leave the grammar love is greater than grammar therefore let us avoid anything that will bring pride anything that will generate strife we don't strive about anything and uh, we don't point out another person's fault with a spirit of pride if you're going to point it out at all wait for the right time when your wife will be very much convinced that you're not criticizing her it will be the stage will be set the discussion will be very nice the atmosphere will be very very good and then at the right time when the atmosphere will permit it then in meekness and lowliness and humility you'll point out and say my dear uh, do you know you should have said this in this way not that way because you said it in the midst of the smiles and the laughter and the joy and the happiness and the sharing together in a very good atmosphere nobody will pick offense you just say it in one minute and you say so oh, is that so that's all right and then you continue your conversation that is how to keep the fellowship in the family now, uh, now i i've told you f a m i i is industry industry that doesn't mean that if you're going to have real fellowship in the family uh, you'll go and get land and establish factory industry <laughs> that's not what i'm saying industry is hard work and that means that i say husband you are industrious and it means that you are going to be able to work very hard to provide for your wife and to provide for the family unfortunately there are men that do not know the reason why we work. Why are we laboring so hard? Why am I trying to keep eight hours on my job? Why am I trying to work for better pay? I'm working for better pay for the family, not for myself. If you understood the reason for working, when you get that money, you will come back home and say, my dear, are you there? Come down and sit down here and sit on the table and you drop the paycheck and you drop the envelope. You say, I've not counted it. Help me to count. 
the husband does not know how to count it is the wife that knows how to count all we know is how to work how to labor how to get the money i don't know how to count that money i don't know how to spend that money it is that woman that god has given the intelligence and the understanding to get that thing in her hand and to know that thank god i am married to a believing husband thank god i am married to somebody that will obey the bible you come back home you sit down together husband and wife and you put it in the hands of your wife and then you say whatever you think i need out of it you can give it back to me but you are the one to manage everything it's an unscriptural family where it is the wife that will give the money to the husband and it is a man that will go and bank it and it is a man that will be doling it out in five naira, ten naira, as if the thing is not there. It is a very bad family where we have a cup and then may, the wife wants to drink water and then you put a drop of water inside that glass, manage it as a bad family but you know if you are really going to satisfy the principles of fellowship within the family you make that cup to be full and when your wife has finished drinking that a full cup you pour it again until she says now it is enough if your wife is always saying i'm suffering even the money i'm earning i give you everything the one you are earning i don't know where everything is going that's not fellowship fellowship is caring fellowship is sharing put everything together there'll be transparency there'll be openness where there is real christian fellowship and so there is industry the wife also needs to work hard not just as to earn money but in keeping the home work hard in cooking for your husband when last did you cook for your husband and your husband said ah, my wife you made me to remember the best food i ate when they sent us for seminar conference in america those people they fed us i felt that it's only american restaurant that can prepare food like that my wife today you make me to remember american restaurant but there you are the food we cook and uh, you know as we're cooking it our sweat is getting into the into the water and it all that we're cooking and eventually while we're serving the food uh, the kettle of water is in one corner of the table and uh, the plate of food that we ate with yesterday is another part of the table and uh, there is cockroach that is you know running around on the table and then we say my husband they take me as i am that is your food there must be working hard you set that table you make that bed you clean the house you do everything as if you are serving a king and don't you know that your husband is a king if he's not uh, a counselor an administrator a governor of any state at least he's the king of that home and is a governor in that home treat him like a king and serve him like a king and prepare his food like a king and prepare his food like this is the best my husband will ever get to eat anywhere he goes that's the fellowship we're talking about that you are very industrious the husband is industrious the wife is industrious and together your industry will be to take care of the family l you know what it is it is love love sacrificial love love is not cheap love is very costly what can i do that's the question of love what can i do to meet the need of my partner you love your spouse more than your business when you are considering a decision to take the first consideration is not business the first consideration is your wife it's your husband you love that husband you love that wife more than business more than career or education when you are considering you want to further your education the first consideration is not i want to get a degree i want to go for my masters the first consideration is how will it affect my husband how will this affect my wife because you love that wife you love that husband more than career more than education number three more than personal liberty 
You know, there are people that just want personal liberty. But you will love your wife more than your personal liberty. Number four, more than money. Which one are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice your wife so you can have more money? Or you are willing to sacrifice money so you can have your wife? It will show which one you love more. When you love your wife more than money, then if money, if getting more money will destroy our fellowship in the family, I let the money go and keep the wife. The same thing with the wife. If you're trying to get more money, will destroy your fellowship with your husband. You will do with less money and you'll keep your husband. Number five, you love your wife, you love your husband more than your parents. Number six, you love one another more than the children. What I mean is, you ought to love your children, but what I mean is that you will not say, hey, I've not got a child, I've not got a child, I've not got a child. Why are you here? You love that wife more than the child that had not been born. And even when the children are born, you don't replace your wife with the children. My children, my children, my children, my children. Are they eating? I about the wife. Will not the wife eat? The wife that produced, that brought the children into the world. The wife that did the cooking. The wife that is uh, helping in everything. My children, my children. Why don't you join my wife also? Which one came first? Children or wife? Tell me. Uh, why have we then shifted the emphasis? Love your wife. And then we love uh, the wife, we love the husband more than everything else except God and the will of God. The only place where we now make a choice is where the will of God is in conflict with what the wife is demanding. The will of God is in conflict with what the husband is demanding. Then over there we have to take a stand and understand that we love God, more than wife, more than husband, but we love our wives, we love our husbands. All your actions and communications must be in love. Before you say anything to your husband, before you say anything to your wife, think about it. Will this be love? There should be nothing done, nothing said out of resentment. Don't do anything out of hatred, out of bitterness out of retaliation out of anger out of selfish consideration love is a key to true fellowship and then practice the golden rule that's what jesus said do unto others as you want them to do unto you put yourself in the wife's position wife put yourself in the husband's position and do what you would have wanted her to do to you if she were in your position uh, why is yielding that means you give up your right for the good of the other. Don't always stand on your right. You know what causes accidents on our roads? The drivers standing on their right. But why don't you yield a little bit? I read something about uh, John Wesley. Uh, there was one of his antagonists coming and uh, he, as he was coming, that antagonist, there was a little bridge and uh, John Wesley was riding a horse and the antagonist was riding a horse and uh, John Wesley was going this way, the antagonist was that the enemy of holiness was coming the other direction. And uh, when Wesley saw him as a preacher of holiness, he turned aside and waited for him to pass. And while the man passed, he said, I never give way for a fool. He was calling uh, Wesley a fool. I never give way, I never yield the right of way for a fool. And Wesley said, I do. The implication is, I give the way for a fool. You don't. <laughs> I do yield the way i mean don't, don't struggle about anything we're family and we're supposed to live together and by the grace of god we live together here in the grace of god and we go over there to continue to live together and you know it will be wonderful that you so love one another that when you get to heaven and jesus said here is your mansion immediately you say where is the mansion for my wife because we want to continue living together for all eternity can it be like that fellowship
Now, as we have talked about uh, family fellowship, let me quickly go to points two and three, the basic qualities of trainers of children. If we're going to train children, we need uh, some basic qualities. Now, we expect teachers who teach our children in the school to be well trained and qualified in the subjects they teach our children. Parents who teach scriptural, spiritual, and moral virtues, therefore, should be qualified to. Spiritual and moral education should begin earlier than secular education and continue long after completing the formal schooling. Understand the preeminence and the importance of spiritual, moral education. It goes beyond the academic work. It goes beyond the formal schooling. And therefore, it should begin earlier. Before the children go to the regular school, let the spiritual schooling, the spiritual training, let that already start at home. And even when they have got all their certificates and they have graduated, let the Christian spiritual as well as moral education continue much longer after they have finished the formal schooling. Parents who send their children to schools in faraway places having negative moral spiritual influence on their children, they turn their children to become prodigals and profligates. It means that you are exalting the academic work you're exalting the lit literal, normal, formal education above the spiritual. That's why you send your children to a school far away. A children you know, a, sorry, a school you know will have negative impact spiritually, morally on your children. You say, well, it doesn't matter. Although I know that spiritually the child may lose out, but I want the education so much. Which one is more important? Is a spiritual aspect. Therefore, you will make sure that anywhere you are sending your children to be educated uh, in the normal sense, you will make sure that in that place, the spiritual aspect will not be cancelled. Parents, teachers, and trainers of children should know the Lord and the Word of God so as to effectively make the children to know the Lord as well. Number one, qualifications, now basic qualifications for our parents who are training their children, for our children, church workers who are training the children. Because of time, I'll not be able to read the very many verses. I'll try to read a few. Number one, we should be of solemn behavior. Because actually, the children learn very much by what they see. And we ought to understand that if we're going to teach the children, we ourselves, number one, must be of solemn behavior. Number two, we must be reasonable in expectation. Reasonable in expectation. Now, children cannot sit quietly as long as adults. And the retentive memory of children or the span of learning is much shorter than that of the adults. Therefore, we must be reasonable in our expectation of children. Uh, you don't uh, sit your child down and give him two hours of lecture. And then after the two hours of lecture, if the child is dozing or sleeping, then you take a stick, you say, I'm going to discipline because the Bible says, uh-uh, the Bible does not say after you sit the child down for two hours, and if he dozes or sleeps, then beat him. The Bible doesn't say that. Therefore, let us make sure we are reasonable in expectation. Number three, possess the ability to communicate the gospel convincingly with children. If we are going to be able to train our children, we need to possess the ability to communicate. Communicating with adults is not the same as communicating with children. Therefore, make sure that you learn. Our children teachers in school and our teenage teachers, that is, those who are teaching our teenagers, make sure that you really possess the communication ability to convincingly teach the children the gospel. Number four, be patient and tender in dealing with those children. They are weak and fragile. Little things 
can discourage them, can put them off, can knock them out, and may so discourage them, they do not want to continue the things of the Lord. Therefore, be patient and be tender in dealing with those weak, fragile minds. Our hearts should be great harbors where many little ships might cast anchor. That means that uh, we, we just love the children. We want to train the children, and the children can lean upon us, and the children know they can trust us, they can have confidence in us, because we really possess the qualities of uh, training the children. Uh, write Psalm 78 down. There will be no time to read all the references. Psalm 78, verses 5, 6, and 7. Write it down. And in... Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 1. Hear ye children, instruction of a father, attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Now you will see what the parent here is saying. He said, I was a child too and I was trained and I also have the responsibility and the assignment of training and developing and teaching you. And the same thing we who are adults who are still children in the hands of God. Your heavenly father is still teaching you and instructing you. Make sure that you are obeying your father while you want your children to obey you. Very important. Psalm 34. Psalm 34 and in verse 11. In Psalm 34 verse 11, come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Be approachable. If you are going to teach children, if you are very fierce, and if you are like a lion in your look, and your tone is very, very harsh, and every time you are carrying a stick in the hand, and uh, you know, if the children laugh, it's a problem. If the children play a little, it's a problem. I don't mean the children should play uh, so much that they destroy valuable things in the house, but at least you know that children will need to exercise their muscles and their, and their bones. And therefore, we should make sure that we are tender, we are approachable, and we are able to teach the children. And what I say in our children church, for our children church teachers, what is the single thing that the children who come to the class in the, on Sunday, what's the single thing they remember? A big stick, then that's bad. Do they remember your smile, your laughter, your touch, your carrying the child? You're patting the head of the child, and you're taking a comb to comb the head of the child, and you're tying the scarf for that little girl, for adjusting the belt of that girl, for tying the shoes of that boy, and for cleaning up, uh, you know, the nose of that, uh, of that child that has a running nose, and for saying some nice, nice, wonderful things. What do the children remember when they come out of the children's church? If it's only the big stick they remember, we are not true training them right. Let them remember some practical things, wonderful things, good things that we are doing in training them. We must know how children learn. We must know how to influence children and instruct children. Parents and trainers must pray much and pray regularly for each child because whatever and however we teach them, the child needs the Holy Spirit to give them new hearts. Our teaching alone the rod and the word alone will not give them everything that they need. Don't you know? Every little child has a stone in the heart that your rod or your spoken word cannot extract, cannot operate and bring out. It takes the operation of the Holy Spirit even on that little child to extract and operate and remove that stone out of the child's heart. That's why with our teaching of the children, we need to pray. Uh, look at these points, write them down because of time. Christian teachers must be experienced. If you are going to teach your children, you must be experienced. Number two, warm-hearted and enthusiastic. 
if you are teaching children and you stand straight and you frown your face you never move your hand you never make any movement in your body and you are rigid like a log of wood the children are going to sleep on you and i'm going to pay attention if you are going to teach children be warm-hearted and be enthusiastic number three be loving and caring they will forget all your three points they'll remember your love they will forget all your academic display. They will remember your love and your care. They will forget all the many verses you quote. They will remember your laughter, your joy, your drama, your playing with them. They will remember your love and your caring. Therefore, be loving and caring. The same thing with our children. Even your own children, play with them. Play with them and talk with them and laugh with them let those children know although you want them to know the bible you want them to read the bible and you are reading the bible with them you are studying the bible with them you are praying with them you also you can laugh with them you can eat with them you can drink with them but um, you know here is a father and he's a big uh, bishop and uh, he's uh, drinking uh, water sitting on the table and the children want to come and eat on the table and then we we'll look at them bishop is eating and you little child you want to get out of that place how is that father to the child or if you allow them at least to even eat on the table with you now they want to drink water and uh, they maybe their own cup of water is not there and it says daddy can i drink out of your cup of water then you look straight and look serious children of today are so rude and rebellious when i was young of your age i could never touch my daddy's cup and say i'm going to drink water but was your daddy born again and sanctified and filled with the holy ghost let christ in you make a difference and give that cup and give your food and give everything to the child and say child take everything i'm living just because of you those children they will be happy they will know that god created them and made them significant and placed them in a home where they can be taken care of number four the leader and the teacher of children must be prayerful intimate with the great shepherd of the little lambs you see jesus is the great shepherd of the little lambs therefore the teacher teaching those little lambs you must be intimate and prayerful because you need the grace and the help of a great shepherd to be able to teach those little lambs number five humble and tender-hearted if we are going to really teach and train our children we must be humble we must be tender-hearted number six the trainers and the parents training their children must leave out the lesson they are teaching continually before the children so that those children can see the good example of our lives long before the teaching of the lessons in the class for the short time I still would like to take, let me go to point number three. Point number three, we're talking of balanced training. Balanced training. In the balanced uh, training that uh, we need, I've told you that we don't want to train the head to go much ahead of the heart. We want the head, the heart, the hand. We want uh, the life of the child to be well balanced together so that the children, by the grace of God, they will be growing. Please write down Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. then please write down first samuel chapter 2 verses 22 to 34 that's where the judgment of god came upon eli because he neglected the training of his children please don't wait for the judgment to be pronounced before then you get in a hurry wanting to teach a five-year course in one week be very careful those children give them attention a little at a time 
a precept here, a word here, a line here, a song here, a prayer there, playing together there, that little, little, little things that you do come together in the training of the children. Not that you would have seen that as a parent, you are a failure. And then you see you have neglected the children for many, many years. And a curriculum that you should have covered for five years, you want to hurry up and cover in one week, it will ruin the children. Don't wait like Eli. Before you begin to say, children, what am I hearing about you? Train your children early. In uh, Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 and verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You will read that together with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. That tells us that the mother and the grandmother of Timothy trained and taught him in the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 29. I didn't even check up whether you wanted the references. And whether you will read them later. Will you read them? You know, there are some notes that are crying that after you wrote me down last year, 95, you have not opened me again. Don't let your notes cry. Therefore, make sure you read them. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15 and verse 21. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 13 to 15. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 13. Training our children from infancy through young adulthood does not just happen without planning and deliberate effort. If you read all those references I've given you, you will see that the training of our children should start from infancy and continue through young adulthood. And those things cannot just happen without deliberate effort and planning. If we have been negligent in the past, we must start the training immediately. But here is where we need a word of wisdom if you see that you have a child or you have children you have neglected the training of the children for many many years now you hear a message like this now and immediately after the congress you go back home and then you say child now i must train you i must teach you and you sit the child down and you begin a kind of training course that doesn't know that this child did not have training earlier. And therefore, you will not just start at the point where you are now. What are you going to do before you start the training? Find out where that child is before you start the training. That's what we do in normal education. We don't just say uh, throw a child into primary three or primary six or GSS uh, one or SS uh, one. We find the level where they are. It is the level where they are now that will help us to know where to start the training and how to start the training. Find out the level of the child, the stage of the child. Number one, you see a spoiled child. 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 6. If he's a spoiled child, there is a method you need to use in training that child. Number two, you see a retarded child. It's not very fast. It is not very quick at catching things. It's very, very slow in understanding. It's a retarded child. There is a method you need to specially apply and teach that child. Number three, you see wayward or rebellious if this child already has developed a pattern of life that this child is already wayward and rebellious there is uh, a way you are going to teach that child that will be different from the way you are teaching the retarded child number four you see a hardened immoral child 
The child has been left alone to himself for a long time. And right now he has picked up some terrible bad habits. And um, the thing is so bad, the child is so immoral, the child is so hardened. You cannot uh, finish your job in just one day, just get to the house after the Congress and say, now, now, you either bow, bend, or break. If you do that, you are going to ruin that child. Uh, you will find out what's the level of this child. And you pick up that child from that point and see how you are going to train the child. Number five, you see withdrawn and bitter. Some things have happened in the family that now the child is scared of you. He's running away from you. He's withdrawn. He's isolated. He's bitter. He will not even talk. He will not respond. He doesn't believe that the parents love him. He doesn't believe that the teachers love him. Therefore, whatever you are saying, whatever lesson you are giving out, is withdrawn. He's isolated. He's bitter. There is a method you will need to use to draw that child nearer to train that child. Number six, you see a delinquent child, a child with strange behavior. You need to learn. You need to find out and make your survey before you know what will really help you in training the child. Number seven, is he demonized or cultic? That child has been left alone to himself for a long time that is now obviously demonic and occultic. You need another method. Now, number eight, is he already saved, well behaved? Well, that's easier, but you still need method. Number nine, you see, intelligent and talented. And it's always saying things above his age. And it's always telling you things that you never thought a child of that age will say. That talented child, that um, intelligent child, there is a way you will teach that child. You see, a very loving, gentle, nice child, there is a way you will teach a gentle child like that. And therefore, you study each child and you seek wisdom from God on how best to help and redeem and train the child the first requirement each parent or teacher of children is to make in the training of the children is to make the training of your children the top priority make the training of every one of your children i'm not talking of just the academic education i'm not talking about paying school fees you must do that i'm not talking of just buying textbooks you must do that i'm not talking about buying school uniform you must do that i'm talking of the training of children that will prepare them for service in the church and prepare them for glory in heaven make the spiritual training the moral training of the children a top priority in your family the decision and determination that we and our household will serve the Lord must be backed up with diligent effort to spend quality time with our children. Follow the guidelines that have been given in Scripture. Train the children in the way they ought to go while they're still young. While that plant is still tender, bend it in the direction it ought to go. If you will do all these things, keep fellowship between husband and wife and make the fellowship very interesting, very enjoyable that you'll be remembering one another. It will be like you are identical together. And also train your children in the way they ought to go. If you will do that, there is no word to describe our contribution to the progress of the world. And the progress of God's kingdom if we will train our children. Our reward will not only be limited to this world, we'll have eternal joy and eternal blessings when we get to heaven. I pray God will help every one of us. Those of us who are married, I pray that God will help us to bring back the fellowship where it ought to be. And those of us who have children, God will help us to train our children. Those of you who are not married yet, you see, the fellowship we are talking about, it takes grace. That's why you need to pray very hard and pray, seek the will of God, the mind of God, so that you'll find a person you can genuinely love, a person you can genuinely spend the rest of your life with. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help us. So there will be real fellowship, rich fellowship, enduring fellowship. 
harmony, unity, love, communion, sharing, partnership in our families. And so that will take definite decision, quality decision to train our children. Don't pray the prayer of a tired man, tired woman. Open your heart to the Lord. Take some decisions before the Lord. Examine the fellowship between you and your wife. How is it? Have you allowed her to come back to your heart, to the place from which the bone was taken originally? Does she know it, that you love her, you honor her, you respect her, you appreciate her? Wife, does your husband know that you love him, you honor him, you respect him, that he is in your heart as you are in his heart? Are you allowing external things and other people to take the place? Where your wife ought to take and where your husband ought to take. Are you a brother in the church, a sister in the church, and you are breaking somebody's family in the church? Your action, your attitude, your visage, your discussion, your conversation with the husband is making him to be separated in his heart from his wife. Your behavior to the woman is making her to love her husband less. That will not be right. Repent before the Lord. Remember, there is a circle drawn around each couple. That an outsider is not allowed to trespass and cross the sacred line and go into that circle. Let's pray that God will give us wisdom, commitment,